Nope. Hello everybody. Uh, today is the fourth lecture of uh, National Academy of Arts, uh, Porcelain and Glass Speciality. And today our guest is uh, Mr. Joseph Cavalleri, who will introduce his work. Uh, Joseph is uh, an artist who is concentrated to work uh, print on st and stained glass. And uh, but he started to work very well and paint also. So jo Joseph is uh, it's a New York artist and educator. His work uh, can be seen in the permanent collection of few museums, including Museum of Arts and Design, uh, Corning Museum of Glass, where he was an uh, educator also. He has uh, classes uh, in a few institutions, like Corning, how I said, uh, in Urban Glass, and so on. So, let's give the... Okay, Joseph, please introduce yourself uh, more and welcome. Thank you that you, you agreed to join us. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Thank you, Elazar. It's a, been a long time. Uh, Elazar and I have known each other for about nine years. I visited Sophia back for a little class and uh, art exhibit. So I know your city pretty well. I'd love to come back at some point. Thank you, Will, our pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll just give a couple of more minutes for latecomers to join the group. But I, I have a lot to talk about, I'm gonna actually put a presentation together for you all about my background, I, I, the processes I use in my work, and also I, some of my, my work and how it's put together. And not only my work, but I'll show some of my students' work also. I feel like it's great to I, I do a lot of teaching, and it's really great to see how uh, students uh, learn the process, and they have all different backgrounds. So it's great to see what they bring to the same techniques that I'm using. Everyone's work is so different. So I'll be showing my work and some of my students' work. I also do uh, lectures on art residencies. I've done about 17 of them. So I'll have some uh, information about that and also about marketing. Uh, marketing and promoting your work is so important. It's, it's a lot of work. I totally enjoy marketing my, my own work because it's a basically time away from the creative uh, process and technical process where you get to, <clears throat> it's like using a different side of your brain that you have to think where your potential clients can see your work and how to market there. And uh, I'll just go over some highlights from that. So, uh, you can start on that, even if you're still uh, taking classes and you're still in college or high school or wherever you are, you can start to think about uh, marketing and set up uh, some basic things that you need to market your work. So I, I'll show that and I, just a bunch of my painted stained glass work. I do painting, silk screening, uh, airbrushing on stained glass. I use, uh, there's a 
product called Color Line enamel paints, and they come in uh, non toxic bottles. And it's pre mixed, it's water based, and they're great to use. So I use that for all of my painting on glass. So it's a Tiffany process where you cut the glass, you put a copper foil around the glass, and then you fire, actually fire the glass in a kiln, and the enamels will actually a uh, polished fire onto the surface of the glass. And then you copper foil and solder it together. So I'll show you some uh, bunch of works that I've done with that process. And it's a really good way to work with glass because you, you can control your imagery very, very uh, finitely and you can put a lot of details into your work. That's what I, I like about working with these techniques. So I think I'm gonna take over the screen and I will uh, do my presentation and then we'll have a, a bit of Q&A afterwards. I use uh, InDesign for all my graphic design work and my presentations. There we go. Okay. So uh, these are basically the uh, points that I'm going to go over today. And I'll keep my uh, clock on here so I don't run over. Uh, and this is a photo from uh, nine years ago when I actually visited the academy uh, or the high school and uh, did a presentation there. Uh, be some students in there. Yep. Uh, this was the director of Urban Glass at the time, Dawn Bennett, and she uh, supervised and organized the visit. It was a great, great visit. Uh, another photo from the class where we were cutting glass. And it was a huge crowd that showed up that day. Really enjoyable. So my background, I, I went to School of Visual Arts here in New York City. And I studied graphic design for four-year bachelor's of art a degree. While I was there, I, I actually moved into uh, an apartment in Little Italy in Manhattan. And uh, actually that space is where I am now, but that's my studio space. So I'm living in the East Village and I have a separate studio space away from my home, which is a great situation. It's nice to have them separated, but this is a very historic neighborhood as you could see. While I was in School of Visual Arts, uh, I had two amazing teachers that stood out the most. Uh, the one on top is Milton Glaser. He was a great graphic designer. He did the I Love New York theme. He did some amazing illustrations. And he did a really great class where we uh, actually had to redesign storefronts, we had to make our own magazine. It was really challenging. Below him is a woman named Paula Scher, and she works uh, at a 
graphic design firm called Pentagram. And this is a sample of her work on the left. She does a, a lot of posters for local theaters in New York. She does signage. And it was the first year she was teaching at School of Visual Arts, and I was really lucky to get her. She was on the ball, and all the teachers there were professionals. So they were working during the day and uh, teaching in the afternoon or at night. So those were two major uh, teachers I had. When I got out of School of Visual Arts, I worked in book publishing, then advertising, and then I started working as an art director in different magazines. These are the three magazines where I worked about six years at each one of them. The reason why I'm showing you this is because working professionally as an artist, uh, it was really good training because I had deadlines. You couldn't wait to be inspired. You had to come up with a design like in an afternoon and show it to other people in the office, the editors and the creative director. And it was really good to keep your mind fresh and to be creative quickly and to keep on schedule. So that's the main thing that I learned from working at magazines. You couldn't wait to be inspired. You couldn't have a day off uh, from being creative. So that training, I actually brought into my glasswork. And I feel like I'm more productive because I have that background. These are two very early works I did when I first started working uh, with glass. I was just getting to know how to copper foil and solder. Uh, the problem with these were they were so intensive to actually cut out all the glass and solder it together. There's like probably like 50 or 60 pieces of glass in each one of these. So I was saying to myself, there has to be a better and more direct way to add imagery onto glass. And at that point, I took four classes at School of Visual Arts or at a, a school in Brooklyn called Urban Glass. And I learned more techniques for adding imagery onto glass. And at that point, I was able to paint onto the pieces of glass uh, using enamel paints and then fire it in a kiln. So the enamel paints, uh, they, they call it a polish fire and it melts onto the surface of the glass. It's permanent. And then you copper foil and solder the glass together. So I really took off with that. You could do major details. You can overlap glass. You can use different color paints, different color glass. Uh, it just made the possibilities really open wide. And I, I was able to do paintings that were more very, very detailed, like this piece here. Uh, this piece is based on a, a La Fontaine fairy tale. And uh, it's called The Two Nanny Goats. And I love basing my work on fables or fairy tales or any kind of stories from history. And basically the story is two nanny goats, they go out for a picnic separately and at one point, they're both climbing over a tree and they are facing each other and neither one wants to go in reverse. So they stand there and argue until the branches break and they both fall into the water and die. So a great uh, story and just a great way of uh, having a 
a really interesting story to do a piece about. And then in 2009, uh, one of my favorite uh, shows on TV at that point, uh, and still on TV, is The Simpsons. So I was uh, thinking about the 2008 recession in America, and I wanted to put an image of an icon on the cross to represent the suffering that America was going through with the financial situation. I was thinking of President Obama or Ronald McDonald, but then I thought Bart and Lisa Simpson would be the best because they're internationally known as American uh, kids or an American family. So I'm basically killing them off in this piece. The, uh, here's a detail of it. It's all hand painted. You can actually see the solder lines that are silver in this. And each color is painted with enamel and then paint uh, fired on in the kiln. Uh, it was a really good challenge. And I felt like uh, it was great solution to a uh, backstory of the economy in New York City, uh, in the US going downhill. So after that, I did that piece, I'm like, why stop with Bartonson and uh, Lisa? And I did Krusty the Clown. And you can see in this piece especially, uh, the technique I used was a lot of hand painting. Uh, the, all the gray is uh, actually used with an airbrush or an atomizer. And I'll show you the atomizer a little later, uh, where you actually spray the paint on so you could get gradation. And I found like a lot of historic stained glass windows in churches. Uh, they didn't have gradation in them. They were very black and white. So once I discovered using an atomizer to spray paint on, it opened up the possibilities. And all these pieces have challenges. This was a really big challenge to actually paint. I think there's 13 Krusty the Clowns there. Uh, this is a, the sisters, uh, just a close up showing uh, how the glass is cut and more painting. I also did a collaboration with an artist. His name is Robert Crumb. He did a, a series of illustrations for Mad Comics. I think it was back in the 1970s in the US and internationally. And I always liked his illustrations. They're, they're very uh, fun, they're lively. Uh, and he always does overweight woman, very voluptuous woman in his work. So with this piece, uh, I actually designed it in InDesign and I sent him a digital file of a, a bunch of ideas that I had. And I asked him uh, if I could use his work in my, in my stained glass work even before I started working on it. And he gave me approval. So I was really great, grateful that he uh, gave me permission to use his imagery. And here are some details. He worked in pen and ink, and I was working with a crow quill pen, which I'll show you a little later, and uh, enamel paints on glass. So a lot of detailed work, he would use cross hatching and I would have to use a paintbrush. So here's a process shot. And uh, you can see the center area is a paint, is painted on stained glass. And the outer pattern is just different colored pieces of glass. And this is a Tiffany technique uh, where you copper foil and then you solder the piece together. There's a close up. 
And there's the final piece. That's the Michelin Man. And a detail. This is French for now is the time to drink. Uh, this piece is in the permanent collection of the Museum of Art and Design here in New York. And it's a triptych. It actually stands on its own because the two side panels are facing in. And this is a process shop. So I use the atomizer or airbrush to do the gradation on the dress. And then I use a soft paintbrush to remove it. So it would be very delicate folds in the material. And it looked really nice, like it was fabric. There's a detail of the face that's supposed to be Paris Hilton, who was very big in America. More recent work based on Alice in Wonderland. So this, I actually did a residency at a place called Goggle Works in Pennsylvania. And my proposal was to do a, a series of paintings featuring Alice in Wonderland, but bring her into modern times. So you could see she uh, is walking some white rabbits. She's actually smoking a pack of cigarettes. And uh, this piece uh, was a lot of very, very fine details to put it together. The area of green, the pattern in there was really, really uh, intense to paint. Back to the Simpsons, a 2018 piece. And uh, just playing with uh, doing a unbalanced uh, design. I just wanted it to be loose and unequal. A lot of my work is very measured, but this one is uh, intentionally a little off kilter. So these are some of the processes I use and when I'm teaching, I use them. The top left is uh, crow quill pens and the color line paints. There's two bottles there. You basically uh, put the paints in the crow quill and you can paint really, really fine lines. On the right is a uh, silk screen of those cars and uh, some copper foil around it. Silk screening, uh, actually the process is pictured in the middle left photograph. So you can use the same paints and silk screen onto the glass. Once it's all fired in the kiln, you can solder it, which is a picture in the center right. Uh, the photo underneath that is just using a paintbrush with the color line paints to fill in uh, a line drawing that you used to make with a crow quill pen. And the bottom left is the atomizer, which is a inexpensive version of an airbrush that you actually blow through the top tube and it sucks up the paint and sprays it just like spray paint. So this, uh, larger piece, I use silk screening in the center part with the figures. I use the atomizer to do the water, the color of the water in, in green. And I use a lot of hand painting and silk screening in the work. This piece uh, was a public art commission and it is uh, for a train station here in uh, upstate New York. The artwork, uh, I designed it, but it is an inch thick. So I was not able to cut the glass myself. So uh, over a year process, we hired a company in Minnesota to actually do the work for me and they painted on the glass, they cut the one inch thick glass, they copied my design and uh, they put it all together and then we installed it. 
So a lot of work, but I was basically supervising and the designer for this work. And that's how it looks with the, uh, at the train station with a train going by. A uh, commission that I had, I wanted to show you guys where I used a uh, frit. So the client wanted to have this image of a print that he had of George Surratt. Uh, and he wanted it really large uh, in stained glass. So I basically scanned the image and I printed it out uh, just on paper. And I was thinking what would be the best way to reproduce this artwork. And I decided to use Frit. You might be familiar with Frit. It's basically chunks of glass that comes in different sizes. So I found the proper size of the uh, Frit and I've got some semi-opaque white glass. And I just sprinkled the print on top. And I put the print of the artwork underneath it so I could copy the uh, darks and lights in it. So this is me pushing the frit around. Uh, and then I fired that glass and soldered it together. Here's the final piece on the floor and the area between the kitchen and the living room. And then we just got the two doormen of the building to lift it up and put it in place. And here is the final work. So a very large scale commission. And there was light coming through from both sides. Another technique of silk screening and airbrushing on the uh, piece of glass. So everything you see in black is silk screened. And then the blue, I use the atomizer to do gradation. Basically two different firings here in the kiln. The background pattern, I wanted all different colors. So I had to cut all those tiles separately and fit them together around that. I, central image. There is a piece before I copper foiled all those pieces. And there is the final piece, which had natural light coming through it. But you see the little white, white switch on the wall? At night, the client wanted to see the artwork. So they installed a electric, electric switch close by and I put LED lights behind the work on the sides so it would light up at night so they could just switch on the artwork. So enough about my work. Uh, when I'm teaching, uh, it's really great to see professional artists and beginning artists take off with the techniques that I teach them. So this woman on top actually did a portrait of her father and she used a silk screen of a car that I brought into the class. And uh, below it was just a combination of different uh, silk screens and hand painting of the rabbits. This artist was a great painter, just oil paints on canvas. And she took off with a painting with the enamel paints on glass. So it's very natural for her. So hand painting and some airbrushing with the atomizer. This student was really fine painter. So uh, the car that you see was a silk screen, but the uh, three different figures were painted by hand. And she basically put a, uh, print out below the glass and she was able to trace it uh, through the glass. So you don't have to be a professional painter. If you have a great image that you either draw yourself or find, you can put it underneath clear glass and then paint on the top of it. This was a self portrait. Uh, it was a nightmare, but she uh, did a, and it looked really like the student and she uh, 
basically used hand painting and airbrushing. This student brought in her own silk screen and this was a portrait of her father. And she did a bunch of prints and then she actually painted his shirt with different color enamels. So uh, each print looked a little different and she atomized the background. So each background was a different color. This uh, Asian student was a really also a very good painter. And she did this uh, portrait uh, all by hand. The background, you might be able to see there's very light palm trees that are printed white on white glass. And then the scallops are printed with the uh, sort of pink color over that. So I really like this piece, not only because she was a really, really fine painter, but the, uh, the overlapping of very delicate colors in the background was a really nice touch. This is a student in uh, Buenos Aires that had tattoos and she just wanted to put her tattoos on stained glass. So I'm coming to the end of the lecture, but I wanted to show you some of my other work. I did a exhibit in uh, Key West, Florida, uh, two Januaries ago of my paintings. And these are oil paintings on uh, canvas. And it was very popular. Uh, the work sold very well. So I feel like I, and this is a recommendation from my teacher, Milton Glazer. He said, once you feel like you accomplished knowing the techniques very well in one form of art, you should try to keep on learning and keep on challenging yourself to another form of art and try that out and see if it works. So instead of painting on glass, I, I, I started painting on canvas with oil paints and I'm totally enjoying it. Uh, I'm still teaching a lot of painting on glass classes and I have some shows of my painting on glass artwork coming up uh, as well as uh, more shows with the oil paints on canvas. So here's our, our two more paintings on canvas. So uh, a bunch of advice, and then we'll go to the questions. And the, I believe this will be recorded so you could see these at a later point. Uh, as you've seen in my work, I love starting a project with a story. Uh, I, I love when I or students put a, a surprise into the work that you don't expect. It could be something very small, but while someone's watching or viewing your work, it just keeps them uh, connected with it uh, and keeps it more exciting. I, as you guys are doing now, experiment, take classes, and Work on your own as much as you can, and you'll over time develop a style and a direction. If you had any other careers uh, or interests in the past, uh, combine those with your work. Uh, it's always good to have a technical uh, direction, uh, but also if you have uh, another totally different interest that you can add to your work. Uh, and once you master one technique, move on to no another, as I showed you with my paintings on canvas. So marketing, I have like a hour long lecture on marketing. <laughs> so I know you don't have that much time. So these are the highlights of my marketing lecture. Uh, before you start to market, make the best work ever 
that you're proud of. So you want to show off uh, when you're at the peak of your creativity. Uh, always good to have a website. Uh, if you don't have a website, it's fine. Post on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn. Uh, right now, I don't have a web page because I'm creating a lot of paintings. For the next year, I have a show in December, and I have to make over 20 paintings for it. And then I have another show the early next year. So I don't want to keep my web page up and going. So I took it down, and I'm only posting on Instagram and Facebook. So it takes a lot of time to have a good looking web page. But if you're up for that, go for it. Also, post videos, process shots. Uh, on Instagram, it's so easy to do, and you'll get a following. And any upcoming events that you're having, uh, shows, exhibits, just post them as much as possible. Uh, and if you have some work that you're, you're proud of, don't keep it at home or in your studio. Get it out, give it to friends, give it to relatives, exchange it for uh, other artwork. Just get it out so the public can see it. And uh, in time, you'll see that your focus uh, will turn to work that sells. For example, uh, when I first did the Simpson series, uh, I found like all six pieces that I did sold very quickly. So now and then I do a new Simpsons piece and it's the first to sell. So I'm focused on, on those pieces that sell. The still lives that did for the show in Florida, they sold very well also. So uh, if you enjoy making them and they're selling, just keep on going in that direction. More marketing advice. I uh, make a lot of contacts now with possible places that you want to show your artwork. So go to galleries, open openings, connect with the uh, curators, just be out there in the art world. So when you're ready to show your artwork, uh, you'll have a lot of contacts and definitely keep in touch with, uh, everybody that you know because they possibly will turn into a collector and with the people that you meet i i always have an email list i have a group a and b group a is potential clients or collectors and group b is friends and family and students so if i have an email or a mailing that is very important I'll send it to everybody, but if it's an actually printed item, I'll just send it to group A. So uh, once you're confident in the work that you're making, uh, it's good to enter some competitions like group shows. There's a website called Cafe, and you could just Google it, uh, Cafe Art, art uh, Openings. And just again, get your work out of your studio, trade it, uh, be creative where you want, where you can show your work. It might be a coffee shop, it might be a, in a store somewhere. Items that are really good to have uh, before you get out into the world, you could, should have a logo, a business card, your website or Instagram. Uh, if you can, or if you're in an art exhibit, try to get an article written about it uh, by contacting a local newspaper or ask if the people organizing the show will get uh, press and articles written about the show. It's really great to, especially now, for people to see your work, even if they get, can't get to the art exhibit in person. In videos, so easy to make yourself <clears throat> and to post on Instagram. 
All right, so I, uh, it's a little overview and of the, some of the pieces that I did. I'm gonna stop sharing and I will go back and see if you guys have any questions. Joseph, I have a new favorite piece of you. Okay, which is that? Yeah, the last one from the uh, la last piece, uh, maybe uh, two or three years ago made. Uh, from the presentation, I haven't okay. seen this one. It's a, it's a new one for me, and it's already a favorite of mine. <laughs> um, Joseph, I would like to ask you, uh, have you ever tried to mix another glass technique with, uh, with uh, silk screening? I, another technique with the silk screening? Yeah, for example, casting a glass fusing. Uh, I, you know, <clears throat> you can, I've had some students <clears throat> want to silk screen and then do a like a glass blowing in a furnace with the glass, but the enamels totally burn off. They're not strong enough to reach that temperature. Mm. Uh, I've had some students use glass fusing and that works, uh, especially with the darker colors like black. If you use uh, lighter colors like yellows or greens, they'll fire out and you won't see them. But yeah, uh, fusing, you can use paint, the enamel paints on it. It's a good effect with the silk screening or the atomizer. Maybe, maybe you can try some uh, ceramic paint also, not only glass enamels. Yeah, you know, I, the ceramic paints and the glass enamels, you can use either one. They're both uh, about the same temperature and they're made up of basically ground up glass. Yeah, and pigment. So yeah. it's a pretty easy to, uh, to use both of them. Any questions from the people watching? And how, how did you decide to start to work, uh, to work glass? Where did you see what motivated you to, uh, to work by glass? You said you, you studied graphic design, then what happened? Well, I, I took a, like four classes at Urban Glass because I really liked working with, like learning the process. And then I was just like, there's something missing. There's there's no silk screening on glass. I, the work that I saw was pretty uh, basic. It was a lot of cut glass and not too much imagery. So I felt like there was a reason to experiment with it. And uh, then it took over. I was working full time and I just got a studio and I worked in the studio after hours. And I just tried to develop a style. So I felt like there was nobody else actually doing the type of work that I, I wanted to see that was really detailed and using like photographs in silk screening in your work. So uh, have you ever tried to work uh, another technique? I mean, not with printmaking. Uh, just to try another way to introduce your idea to the public. I uh, well, before I got interested in glass, I, you know, I was doing in college. I did a lot of silk screening on paper. I, as an art director, it was just doing graphic design for the greater public. I mean, it was a group effort. So it was doing my art, but it was more of a collaboration with the writers 
in illustrators that I worked with. So it was still showing my artwork, but a, in a very different way. Instead of me having total control over it, it was having a group of people present a finished magazine. So it's very different ways of working. Yeah. Thank you, Joseph. Some other questions, guys? I think Yvette has a, a question. question. Yeah. Uh, uh, hello, Joseph. It's a pleasure for me to meet you and uh, to see your works. It's a great uh, inspiration for me because uh, with the Lizard now, I'm his uh, student in master's degree. Uh, we are working on the uh, stainless glass uh, project now. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a question. Uh, which are your uh, three uh, artists uh, which work in the uh, who are actually uh, the, your favorite artists with, uh, who work in uh, stained glass technique? Okay, you probably know Judith Schechter. Uh, she does a lot of work with flash glass. And uh, I actually was a student of hers and I was a teacher's assistant of hers. And she was really, really uh, inspirational. Uh, not just with a vision, but how to teach. Because I was an assistant with her and I learned all the work that you have to do before you teach, which is a lot of work. Uh, there is a woman here in New York, I, Mary, I think her last name is McFarlane. And she, I, she uh, was the head of the American Glass Guild. And uh, she did some really great uh, patterns uh, and sort of more abstract work. So totally different than my work, but really great use of color. And she actually ran the American Glass Guild for years and it was a great, small organization that we could actually meet other glass artists from around the country. Uh, the third one, you know, for glass artists, I, a third doesn't come to mind, but there's other artists that I just love their work, like Milton Glaser and Paula Scher that I showed uh, that were teachers. And I think uh, any type of work that works in print can work in glass. When I teach, I ask students to design something and not think about how they're gonna make it. Not think about what color glass they're gonna use or how they're gonna cut the glass. I like for them to have the vision very clear and straightforward and finished like a sketch that is finished. And then we decide how to make it on glass. So it's, it's a challenge to draw something with a pencil and then <laughs> get it onto glass. But I, I feel like you shouldn't like conserve your uh, techniques uh, because they're not gonna be able to, you won't be able to do it in glass. Because you could do just about everything you could do on a canvas or a piece of paper on glass. <laughs> Thank you, Joseph. <laughs> Good luck with your project. Any other questions? Yes, I have a question. Great. Uh, did you have any of your glass works broken? Oh, yes. I mean, you, you send it to some gallery and they return it in pieces. I, that only happened once. And there was insurance on it. So I was actually able to uh, fix it. Uh, one piece I had to send to, uh, to Venice, Italy. And it was a really large piece, but it was sent from a, a client's collection 
so it was in a show in Venice and then they sent it back to us. It wasn't broken, but it was like indented. So I had to basically push it back in place and re-solder it. But it was very scary. Uh, some of my work that I had at home, I uh, just for some reason or another fell off the wall or <laughs> I was soldering it. There's a certain percentage of your glass that's going to break. It's glass. The first time it happens, it's horrible, but you'll you'll get used to it. <laughs> it's uh, something you're using a fragile material. Uh, if it's sent to a gallery, you should actually uh, try to have a discussion with them, like who has control and insurance on the work and what time to that end and start. So if they are handling the artwork, uh, they should have insurance. Uh, and the, if it's broken when they're when they have it, they should pay the full amount. But you always have to have that discussion before you actually send the artwork to them. Uh, thank you about your answer. You're welcome. Um, hello, Joseph. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, I have uh, one technical question and one less technical question. Okay. Um, my first question is, um, do you use the Tiffany technique also for 3D objects? And if you, um, and why or why, why not does that interest you? Why not what? Or why or why not does that interest you, the Tiffany technique in a 3D? Uh, 3D. Uh, uh, I've done some uh, some 3D work, and I uh, it's it I like it. I really enjoy it. I uh, I've made some uh, candle holders and some uh, votives, and it's it's some of them are functional. So. People love artwork that is fun functional. So I, I actually made a, a, it was like a little votive, which is like a candle that is, it's an electronic candle. And I made a 3D, uh, almost like a lampshade for over it. And I made 10 of them and I sold them through Facebook very quickly. And it was a great process. So it's, uh, I'm going to do more of that. And I've taught uh, making more uh, three-dimensional artworks. At the same time, I feel like artwork that you hang on a wall and is more like a traditional painting, people will appreciate more. It's a more traditional, and they'll uh, actually view it and appreciate it more. Uh, behind the work, I actually do a frame with the LED lights so you can light up the work. And you don't have to put it in the window. So uh, the uh, three-dimensional, I, I say go for it. I, I, if I had a clone of myself, I would have them doing three-dimensional work for me. And thank you very much. Uh, my second question is uh, related to sandblasting. Do you use sandblasting at all in order to transfer images? Um, I, I use it for more like simple images. So I'll get what we call contact paper, which is a uh, resist. It's a plastic sheet that is sticky on the back. And you can cut out shapes with an X-Acto knife or scissors and then use a sandblaster. And then a lot of times I'll rub the enamel paints into the sandblasted area and I'll fire it. So you can get very detailed hard edge shapes using a sandblaster 
and the enamel paints and firing it. I sometimes I've just used sandblasting if I wanted a very light frosted effect in some of my paintings. Like if I was having a clouds on the glass, it's a great fast way of a, just getting a very light sandblasted uh, effect. So I, yeah, I, I like using it. The thing is I have to take the subway to Brooklyn to use the sandblaster there. So I'd like to have a lot of work to do instead of spending like two hours to do a piece like this size. It's not worth it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sure thing. Anybody else? Uh, if other questions come up, uh, feel free to uh, email me. Elzar should have my email. If you think of something like tomorrow or next week. Yes, uh, I do think of your email. I'll be glad to answer. Uh, I have another question. Great. Uh, what was your biggest obstacles in painting on glass? I mean, you started your first piece in glass. What was the hardest part about it? I Finding the right paint. Because when I first started painting, the color line paints didn't exist. You were using Rouché paints, which are powders. And you had to mix them with water or oils. And it was just really hard to actually paint a really fine line with that. Uh, and silk screening was ridiculous because you had to mix powdered enamels with a silk screen base, which is almost like a gel. And you would be mixing for at least a half an hour to get it really smooth. And then you could silk screen with that. But those paints were toxic. And it was just like, this is not, not healthy at all. So I really like the color line paints because they're non-toxic. They're water-based, really easy to clean up. So at some point, I was able to find a new product to use. So I didn't have to go through all that trouble of hand mixing the enamel paints. So that, that worked to my advantage. Uh, that sounds really, really interesting. Yeah, because my first uh, flat glass painting with uh, paints was a disaster, as I remember it, because the paint uh, doesn't go in one place. It goes everywhere. So it was really not that uh, beautiful. Yeah, the, it's, it's almost like using gouache. It's really thick. And I, I always, when I have a new paint or a new piece of glass, I do a little test piece and I paint all the colors on the glass or if it's a new color paint, I'll paint it on white or clear glass and I'll do a test firing. I, because sometimes you'll spend like five hours painting something and you put it in the kiln and it doesn't fire correctly. So always do a test firing. It's a really, will save you a lot of time in the long run. But uh, yeah, getting the paints easy to work with is was one of the most difficult until the color line products came out. So I was happy about that. And I actually, they asked me to test out the paints. They're based in uh, Zurich, Switzerland. So I tested them out and they said, if you really like the paints, if they work correctly, we'll have you come to Zurich and teach a class. So thank God I like them. And I, I've been there like twice to teach. Uh, and it's, it's a great product. It's really, really easy to paint with and a, to just control on a paintbrush. And I use a paintbrush, it's called a, liner brush 
it has very, very long bristles and it's very thin. So you could actually put a lot of paint on it when you're painting and keep the paint fairly thin. Uh, thank you about explaining the interesting you're process. Well. Thank you very, very much. Good thing. Any other questions, guys? Unfortunately, I, I don't see a questions from YouTube and from Facebook. So if you don't have any other questions, I want to say, Joseph, thank you very much for uh, your nice presentation. Uh, I really hope one day you go back uh, in Bulgaria and you visit our academy, not only our school. Uh, and hopefully we can make a project together. That sounds excellent. So okay. good to see you again and to meet all your students. Good luck with everything. And again, don't be shy if you have more questions. All righty. Take care, everybody. Thank you very much, Thank and you. for uh, your uh, uh, for your um, explaining about the market. Also, it's very important for our students because some of them are going to graduate very soon, and they have to start their right. work to survive. <laughs> yeah, you know, most of the sales I've had were, I'd say, like good. 60% were from people that I know. So I have a lot of friends, <laughs> a lot of contacts. But it's great when a stranger buys your artwork. Let's see. Even that, nice. uh, you have a lot of contacts because you're a very positive person. And we can see from your uh, piece of art, which are, uh, how to say, they have a jokes inside, which is very touchful. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All righty. Okay. Well, pleasure to be here. Okay. Thank you very much. And All righty. See you again. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.